spring 2000. Angry young Serbs have declared a nonviolent war against the man they say has stolen the best 10 years of their lives. His name is Slobodan Milosevic. Slobo, as he is known, is loved by his Socialist Party friends. But his mild manner is deceptive. He is also known as the bloodiest tyrant in Europe, the Butcher of the Balkans. Milosevic has taken his country to war in Croatia, Bosnia, Kosovo. He has brought ethnic cleansing, concentration camps. He has brought unemployment, poverty, corruption, repression, and fear. In 1998, Milosevic began driving ethnic Albanians out of Kosovo, creating nearly a million refugees. Western outrage over a massacre of civilians in early 1999 set the stage for a massive bombing campaign by NATO. For 78 days, at a cost of $3 billion, the bombs fell. United by their suffering, many Serbs rallied around Milosevic. The bombing compelled him to withdraw his forces from Kosovo, but he remained defiant bragging that he had faced down the NATO bully and survived. He didn't care how much damage his army suffered or his people suffered. What he cared about was his own hold on power. The bombing, in the end, clearly strengthened his hold on power in the short term. It may have, in the longer term, undermined it. But the notion that he was going to worry about military damage is nonsense. He wasn't going to. But I heard many, many times in the State Department, he will only respond to force. After the bombing, thousands of protesters, led by students, take to the streets against Milosevic. Security forces deal with them easily. And though they are determined, marching day after day, demonstrations are no serious threat to the regime. But among the opposition, one group knows that protest is not enough. Working quietly, they target the very foundation of Milosevic's power, the ordinary people who until now have been afraid to oppose him. Their symbol, the clenched fist. Their name, Otpor, the Serbian word for resistance. Otpor, resistance, is already a year old. But in the aftermath of the NATO bombing, it's growing fast. Founded by a dozen student activists in their teens and 20s, Otpor has no offices. They operate on a shoestring, meeting in cafes, communicating by cell phone. Some of them have been arrested, and the police monitor them closely. We have a long history of guerrilla movements winning the power in this country. So when I say guerrilla, I don't think about violence. I just seen, seen about, think about hidden leadership, some kind of mysteria about that. Uh, there is an organization where we are, the, the, the whole story of Otpor, even the recruitment list you are filling, is like you're joining the army. The army with a mission. Their numbers are small, but they create the impression of an extensive organization. Stark black and white leaflets reinforce their blunt slogans. Bite the system. Resistance, because I love Serbia. Freedom. 
The fist and the slogans become ubiquitous, proof that opposition to Milosevic is possible. Serbia's opposition politicians are divided as they try to capitalize on popular discontent after the bombing. Zoran Djindjic heads the best organized party, but there are two dozen political parties, and most Serbs have lost faith in politicians. There is so many people in Serbia who will say that all the political leaders are corrupt. I don't believe anybody. I don't believe Djindjic. I don't believe Kustunic. I don't believe Drashkovic. I don't believe anybody. And that was, that was one of the sources of Milosevic's uh, uh, success for so long, because many of people would say, okay, not Milosevic, but who else? Who else? And these, uh, these uh, young girls and boys from Otpor said, no, let's finish with Milosevic. That is important. Otpor's activists make it clear they're not running for office. To preserve their freedom of action and to maintain their clean, uncorrupted image, they refuse to align with any of Serbia's political parties. But they are not reluctant to accept help from outside the country. Soon after Atpour was formed, they had meetings with, with senior international officials, including Americans, and we all recognized the incredible talent and capacity within Atpour. Now, they made clear they wanted to be seen as a, a largely Serbian, you know, Yugoslav institution, not as a tool of the West. And, you know, we respected that. We thought that was a smart judgment. <laughs> so, so from the beginning, we saw in Atpour a, a, a degree of enthusiasm and talent, just kind of political sense that was really encouraging and, and deserved our support, however we could, we could offer it. U.S. foreign aid, designated to promote democracy in Eastern Europe, helps with Akpur expenses. But the inspiration for what they call actions is all their own. On Milosevic's birthday, they make a cake. The cake signifies our country, which fell apart. It's like all those pieces of cakes are falling apart, and they are eaten by Slobos. On the lunar eclipse, they invite shoppers to view the eclipse they have in mind. Everything we did must have a dosage of humor. Because I'm joking, you're becoming angry. You're always showing only one face, and I'm always again with another joke, with another action, with another positive message to the wider audience. And that's how we collected the third party in the whole story, which is the very important, the publicity, the people on the ground. Akpor invites Belgrade to a New Year's Eve party. Rock music is discouraged by the regime, but rock and roll with its undercurrent of rebellion and resistance is an Akpor trademark. At midnight, instead of the traditional celebration, Otpor shows the names and pictures of Serbs who died in Milosevic's wars. They came here asking for fun. We gave them performance before the midnight. After midnight, we, 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 we broadcasted them through big screen, the, the, the tragic film of people, dead, refugees, all the bad things and we say, there is no reason for the celebration. Go home and think what to do. So the next Orthodox New Year, we have a reason to celebrate. But the key sentence was, this is the year, 2000. This is the year with capital T. 
this year, life finally must win in Serbia. A month later, Serbia's Socialist Party holds its fifth Congress to re-elect its president. Da je Slobodan Milošević, kandidat za predsjednika Socialističke partije Srbije, dobio 2308 glasova. Serbia's ruling elites are leftovers from Soviet-style communism. Now they are called socialists, but the old ways persist. Milošević rewards loyalty and punishes disobedience. His re-election is rubber-stamped democracy that fools no one. Across town on the same evening, Otpor stages a parody of the socialist charade, billed as the first Otpor Congress. Otpor's first national meeting attracts major opposition party leaders and a few journalists willing to risk prosecution for publicizing an illegal organization. <laughs> Samim tim što smo postali najproganjanija politička grupacija u Srbiji, samim tim te sile priznale su da je Otpor i sam postao sila! Police harassment has not discouraged them. Recent arrests have spurred a surge in membership. Danas imamo otpor u preko 70 gradova u Srbiji. Boasting activists from all over Serbia Otpor declares itself a national movement. We did everything like we are a massive movement. We made a congress like, I don't know, we cover whole Serbia. And then after the congress we did cover whole Serbia. We, I don't know, said we are a people's movement, although we were just a bunch of students. But after that we became a people's movement and Everyone came to us. Otpor's recruiting strategy relies on shock therapy, the clenched fist, stormtrooper wardrobes, and black leather are intentionally sinister. It's all part of the message. They had tremendous enthusiasm, the keenness of these kids to do something was extraordinary. But there were others in official positions who raised some eyebrows about that. I mean, did they really want to be uh, supporting student protesters whose symbol was a clenched fist. I mean, that goes a little far for the U.S. government. To the credit of uh, those who were in charge, they were eventually convinced that that was a good idea. And if you talk to the Otpor kids, you realize these were not crazy kids. These were people who wanted to be free. <laughs> Prekinite sa nasiljem, prekinite sa progonima, prekinite sa represijom, prekinite sa državnim terorizmom. Now Otpor has a Belgrade office, a three-room apartment lent by an activist's parents. Otpor is one of a dozen Serb opposition groups which receive money from the U.S. and European countries to pay for copiers, telephones, postage and printing, computers, and internet service. Otpor established a website even before it had an office. Their demands and principles are posted in both Serbian and English. The nonviolent removal of Milosevic, free elections, democracy. Otpor's agenda is homegrown, 
But it's no secret that U.S. and European funding is helping them spread the message. In late winter, Otpor's foreign financing makes it vulnerable. But when Milosevic says Otpor is an American puppet, they know they're becoming effective. The people in these countries don't always like it done openly. And that's understandable too, but there's a big difference between that and a covert program. These were not covert programs. They were overt programs, uh, and they were aimed not at the overthrow of Milosevic, but at building up the elements of, uh, of a democratic society. Otpor's foreign support is more than money. The International Republican Institute in Washington recommends books on nonviolent strategy by the American scholar Gene Sharp and arranges for one of Sharp's colleagues, a retired army officer, to give them a weekend seminar. And I explained it. It's a form of warfare, and you've got to think of it in terms of a war. And if you decide to accept nonviolent struggle, then the same principles of war, we mentioned objective. You mentioned mass, you know, be able to get your forces together at the decisive point. And the initiative, you know, you, you're never going to win by being on the defensive. You've got to take the offense, whether it's in a military struggle or in an armed struggle. So the overlap of the principles of war are the same. There we were faced with the essential things we were already applying here, but just we didn't know that somebody has written a book about that. So it was amazing experience having this book in the hands, seeing that systematically written on one place, which we developed by our experience, <coughs> looking towards to what Gandhi's movement did and so on and so on. Colonel Helvey's main lesson is now disseminated. Eliminate the authority of the ruler. Elections are still at least a year away. In the meantime, Akpor builds its network using other weapons to undermine Milosevic. Recruiting and training hundreds of grassroots activists, Akpor has no national leader or central committee. Belgrade sends supplies, but local Akpor activists run their own affairs. It's a conscious strategy to create so many layers of leadership that it will be impossible to arrest them all. Akpor relies on local kids, well known in their own neighborhoods, as the best way to mobilize the discontent, which is strongest in the provinces. Smaller cities became the center of the opposition, and Belgrade was like a black hole. There were no independent electronic media in Belgrade in the last two years. There, uh, uh, everything was kind of silent. And in uh, cities like Chacha, Knish, Novi Sad, Kraljevo, Užice, uh, the situation was very hot. People were very, uh, very uh, uh, dissatisfied and very angry and very uh, they, radical. As Akpor organizes in town after town, 
the regime faces a dilemma, whether to continue small-scale repression or launch an all-out offensive. On May 14th, the state information minister suddenly escalates the attack on Otpor in a nationally televised press conference. Having labeled Otpor a terrorist group, the regime unleashes a wave of beatings and arrests. Otpor has expected the repression and prepared for it. With each arrest, protesters quickly appear at police stations and prisons. We developed this chain of command. When the information of harassment comes to the central office or the local office, there was a system producing press release, uh, providing the lawyer's help to the arrested guy, and producing as many activists as we can in proper moment to be in 10 minutes in front of the police station. So that was really important to develop such kind of solidarity. They were afraid of us, and they wanted to portray us as, as terrorists, as fascists, and as, I don't know, criminals, drug addicts, and something like that. <coughs> but when uh, people go out in the streets, they see members of resistance, they see that these kids are like 18 to 20 years of age. I'm one of the o older members, like I'm 26, 27 now. And they say, come on, this is ridiculous. These kids are not fascists. These kids are just kids. So it was very important for us to show how the state television propaganda was actually ridiculous. After midnight on May 17, the police take over Belgrade's largest TV station, two independent radio stations, and a newspaper which has criticized the regime. In the morning, the city discovers its best sources of independent news have been cut off. During the day, thousands of protesters assemble at the city hall. With this latest escalation, Milosevic has aroused thousands of people who have never before taken part in political protest. Through the day, through the night, all the next day, and the next evening, the protest continues. At 10 o'clock, the regime has had enough. The main mistake of, of the regime was that 
they spread the circle of, of those who were under the repression. And that's why this repression was counterproductive, because uh, it is like the third Newton law of action and reaction. When you raise the level of, 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 of repression, the resistance goes up as well. Ten days later, Akpor members from the provinces march into Belgrade. They have come to put the squeeze on Serbia's opposition political leaders, to stop their bickering and work together against Milosevic. Most of the party chiefs don't want to be here, but no one wants his rivals to have the stage to themselves. If they run against each other, as they always have, Milosevic will win. Akpor wants them to work together, but the party chiefs are suspicious and jealous of Akpor's growing popularity. They were, they were really worried because we were filling the, the political space, you know, like cancer. Uh, filling all the blanks for which they didn't, uh, wasn't able to fill. Giving all the answers to, to all the issues people asked, which they were not uh, uh, clever or competent enough to give, and uh, having the strongest network. Their reluctance to touch the flag of the brash Akpor movement shows how hard it will be for them to work together against Milosevic in next year's election. On July 27th, Milosevic springs a surprise, calling for elections 10 months ahead of schedule. He knows the opposition is unprepared, and he badly needs to renew his claim to legitimacy. He understood that his position is getting worse every day. He was trying to save what there still existed as support for him. That's one thing. The second thing is he was prepared to steal. And the third thing is he was prepared to keep his power by force. Under Milosevic, average income has fallen from $800 a month to 50. A newspaper reports that the majority of voters are wearing 10-year-old shoes. Milosevic is vulnerable, but against a divided opposition, it won't be hard to steal or even win the election. September 1st. Serbia's opposition unveils a new coalition to run against Milosevic. Pro-democracy groups like Akpor have demanded it, and the Americans and Europeans have offered to help if they work together. Their coalition is called the Democratic Opposition of Serbia, DAS. DAS is 18 parties pledged to support a single presidential candidate a man barely known outside Belgrade's political elite. His name is Boyislav Kostunica. Kostunica is a lawyer who heads a small party. Opinion polls have shown he is the best candidate to run against Milosevic. His nationalist credentials and anti-American rhetoric will make it impossible for Milosevic to call him a traitor. Serbia's ethnic minorities will be the key in what is sure to be a close election. Albanaca, Hrvata i ostali.
Kostunica works the smaller towns where Milosevic dares not go. DOS strategists get help from U.S. pollsters and political advisors based outside Serbia. The polling told us the voter desperately wanted a reason to vote against Milosevic and for a better life in Serbia. So we really worked with the party leadership to understand they had to go out and meet the voter one-on-one. -on -one. You know, shaking hands as you go through the market, going and knocking on doors, doing telephone calls. And as a, as a consequence, they got tons of local press, local television, and they were able to compensate for what they couldn't get in Belgrade. The positive message was our vision of the new way of life because we have been so tired by uh, our life uh, being so uncertain, uh, wars, pressures, Milosevic's repression. And my impression during that campaign, talking to so many people, was that actually that's what they needed and that's what they dreamed about. So they were not uh, just thinking so much about Milosevic. Kashtunica stresses the positive. But the catchiest campaign slogan is negative. Invented by Otpor, Gotov Ye, he's finished. Gotov Ye, he's finished. It was daring, audacious, bold to say Milosevic, he's finished. They didn't even say Milosevic. They said, he's finished. Everybody knew what they meant. And they did this over and over with different slogans that they have an edge to them. They fit in the society in a, in a remarkable way. Kastunica campaigns alone. Other party leaders like Zoran Djindjic set aside their own substantial egos and ambitions to campaign separately on his behalf. Das and Kostunica are reinforced by Akpor and others. At least five major campaigns coordinated but separate. They have the advantage because Milosevic can't attack them all. The advantage of opposition in this campaign was that the campaign was dispersed. Otpor in one side, other non-governmental organizations, G17+, plus, those parties and Kostunica. We had five campaigns, so we didn't know who is, who is the leader. It was not recognizable, so Milosevic didn't know who should be attacked. Milosevic makes his first campaign appearance only two weeks before the election. For him, personal contact with the voters is unnecessary. It's no secret that the Socialist Party pays people to turn out for his rallies, to make better pictures on state television. On independent TV stations, the opposition campaign dominates. Skida 
Less dramatic than campaign speeches and commercials, the training of poll watchers is probably more important. The sessions are organized by the Center for Free Elections and Democracy, a Serbian civic group which teaches how to spot and prevent vote fraud by Milosevic election authorities. By election day, the Democratic opposition, Get Out the Vote groups, Otpor, dozens of pro-democracy and human rights organizations, and independent media have joined in the campaign. In the last year, they have received $25 million from American sources. When the voting stations close, all parties certify the count at each location. Any attempt to steal the election will have to be committed by the regime in Belgrade. There were 10,000 polling places. You need at least 30,000 people to monitor 10,000 polling places. Had they really organized 30,000 people? Well, not only had they organized something like 30,000 people, but they had organized this incredible effort to convey the election results to Belgrade almost immediately so that when the fraud occurred, they had numbers that demonstrated the fraud. An email network feeds the results to a computer center. As they wait for the votes to be totaled, there is little doubt of the result. But no one knows what will come next. We knew that we will win. We knew, and we, we knew that Milosevic will not accept. And our uh, advantage was we were prepared for the second uh, step, that he will not win, he will not accept our victory, and he will try uh, to manipulate after that. At campaign headquarters after midnight, they wait until the tabulations have been double-checked. Then they make the announcement which will make manipulation of the official results impossible. Prema našim podacima izvesna je pobjeda u prvom krugu predsjedničkih izbora. Only one question remains when or whether the winner will take office. In the next days, as Belgrade holds its breath, Milosevic's electoral commission says neither candidate pulled over 50% and calls for a runoff election. Vi ćete imati najveći zadatak u životu. Ako stvari stoje onako kako ja mislim da stoje, mi ćemo morati organizujemo proteste. Vi ste trenirani da to sprovedete. Vi ste pravili mrežu po fakultetima. Ovo je vaš protest. Sve što se bude dešavalo je vaš. They've trained and organized for months. Now they face the decisive test of their nonviolent movement. Can they force the regime to step down? Das and Kostunica declare a runoff is unnecessary and call upon the people to prepare for a general strike. Three days before the strike is to begin, coal miners at the Kalubara mine, just south of Belgrade, give Kostunica an unexpected boost. A committee representing 17,000 workers votes to strike immediately. They say they want their action to inspire the rest of the country to support the strike. The mine, which produces 70% of Serbia's electrical power, is idle. 
The miners have set an example. Now the rest of the country joins them in a nationwide action to bring all normal life to a standstill. We knew that Milosevic can uh, uh, resist only with support from police and army. And we knew if he can uh, 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 affect police and army around him and bring them uh, to, to think, uh, should they uh, support Milosevic or not, or the people, that he cannot survive. And uh, it was very important for us to find uh, symbols uh, of this uh, very wide national resistance and to show to the police and to army that it's not just opposition against government, but that it's uh, people against Milosevic. As police and army encircle the striking miners, ordinary people respond to an urgent call to support and protect the strikers. Thousands come, a signal to the police and army that Milosevic is finished. In larger cities, taxi drivers join in slow-moving rolling blockades. Public transport drivers park their buses and streetcars across major intersections. The police try to maintain order, but every day the strike spreads. Having lost the election and been thwarted in his attempts to steal it, Milosevic must now step down or use violence. We had the nation trained not to attack the police, not to use the violence, because our message was uh, there is no war between police and us, that we together are the victims of the system, and there is no reason to, be, to have war between victims and victims. One victims are in blue uniforms, either other victims are in blue jeans, but there is no reason for that blood. Das and its supporters are angry and persistent, but they are also patient, determined to avoid bloodshed as they slowly escalate their actions. It was uh, crucial that uh, we uh, left enough time for these people in, in regime to understand what is going on. It was not just one day, a uh, revolution, but it was 10 days with daily increasing this pressure and Serbia was in blockade. But by the end, it, it, was, it was absolutely clear that the majority is against Milosevic. Ten days after the election, almost no one in Belgrade realizes the turning point is at hand. Since before daybreak, Serbia has been on the move, converging on the capital from every direction. The operation has been quietly planned by DOS leaders across the country. Convoy leaders have prepared for police resistance. They've even brought bulldozers to break through barricades if necessary. At 9 a.m., one convoy led by the mayor of Chachok in his jogging suit finds the road completely blocked by police. Dobro, ćemo li mi da preduzim akciju da vi ništa se ne mešate? 
Vi i Urvi ste vaše uradili i pod naređenja, mi ćemo naš, znači nemoj samo vidjeti. Dajte šansu da nam se priključite, ljudi. Znači, i plomiće kamione bez veze. Recite im da ne lome kamione, znači nema nikakve ingerencije, ništa. Kad dođe starešina, sačekajte, strepte se. Više što dođe, večera. Svakog trenutka dolazi, dogovorite se. Jel može tako? Ne, ne. Tired of negotiating? the men of the Chachak convoy removed the blockade themselves. These people who came from cities like Chachak or Ružice, they were prepared to do anything. They were not just the urban demonstrators, as, as the most people of Belgrade, you know, just go to the streets and shout and then go home. No. These people came here to do something and they will not go back home before that is finished. Special units for anti-terrorist actions were expecting us in Belgrade. They'd been cooperating with us closely. We made radio contact with them every 10 minutes. I would then give the information to my fellow citizens. We have the police. They are taking our side any minute now. As the morning goes on, it becomes clear that the police will build barricades but not defend them. Convoys from the south enter Belgrade at about 11 in the morning. Their rendezvous point is the federal parliament building. Mayor Illich stays in contact with convoys still on the road. They plan to link up for a non-violent takeover of the parliament at 3 p.m. contacts with commanders, Das has been assured the security forces will step aside. But no one takes it for granted. We didn't uh, know uh, how police will, uh, would react. We knew that some part of police uh, uh, will not uh, uh, react against the people, but we, do, we didn't know about all parts of police. And the police were very, very confused. The impatient Chachok contingent advances before the other convoys arrive, but they are easily repelled. What the police don't know is that hundreds of thousands of Serbs are still on the road to Belgrade the farmers and workers who supported Akpur and are determined to stop the theft of their boats. Hours after the first convoys arrived in the capital, the news reaches Belgrade citizens. They come into the streets chanting, Serbia has arisen. On this day, there is only one place to be. DAS leaders, now monitoring police radio channels, listen as orders are given to remove the crowds. But nothing happens. Oh, 
they didn't really mean to do anything. They simply ignored the orders and they observed what is going on. And when they realized that there is a hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of Belgrade and there is more and more and more coming from all parts of Serbia and that you have a kind of uprising in this country. Of course, they knew that uh, any kind of using the force against these people would be a, a, a self-destruction and they, they realized that it would mean that they are losers together with Milosevic. They didn't want that to happen. A reporter wrote, the police and army commanders never ordered their troops to fire because they knew their own kids were in that crowd. Inside the building, they find thousands of presidential ballots, pre-marked for Milosevic. Well, breaking the few windows and, and, uh, and a parliament in flames, it's just nothing. Uh, in comparison to the former period here, uh, to what Milosevic did here, to what other Balkan, ba Balkan, uh, Balkan countries did here, to what United States did here with its bombs, that was like a children's game. Two lives are lost in the takeover, to a heart attack suffered by an elderly man in the crowd and a traffic accident. Milosevic has not been seen in two days, but there is no doubt he's finished. The people have taken power. What we needed the whole time was not the threat or use of force. It was the threat to his hold on power, and that was best gained through democratic forces within Serbia. And, uh, you know, the grand lesson here is that broad-based coalition of popular nonviolent protest can sweep away a dictatorship much more quickly than all the covert action on earth. I think we succeeded because we simply loved life more than them. Generally, those guys were the preachers of the death. Their hatred, their propaganda, you know, their, their, their language smelled like that. And we won because we loved life more. We decided to love life and, and you can't be the life. So this is what Otterberg did. We were a, a group of fans of life. And this is why we succeeded. <laughs>